I hope you had a chance to see the festival of lessons and carols on Christmas Eve. The one that was a retrospective where we used videotape down through the time epochs. It was awesome and it was so spiritual, except I have to admit, I found myself whenever the video time was in the 1980s, I became fascinated with how big the hair was. Did you see all the big hair in the sanctuary? Big and poofy. I forgot how poofy hair was in the 1980s. I wonder if poofiness will ever come back. But did you also see the magnificent shagginess? I'm talking to Pastor Jacob that, you know, now he's in California and his hair is hip and short. But did you see that glorious shagginess? It made Christmas for me. But I also loved seeing Otis Young. He was pastor of this church for 34 years, and it helped me remember how wonderful it was to work with him. When I first came, I worked alongside him, and he became a mentor and a coach to me. You know, like a good football or basketball coach, they'll teach you the fundamentals, but they're really also teaching life lessons. This is what I experienced with Otis. He was a great coach. He'd teach me some fundamentals about ministry, and then it would occur to me he was teaching me about life. One of the fundamentals for ministry in Otis's mind was positivity beats out negativity all the time. He was such a naturally optimistic man, and he felt that churches should be a place of positivity where people can come and set aside the troubles in life and experience a type of peace. He said, Jim, don't imagine as pastor of the church, your main job is to solve problems. Your main job is never just to solve problems. That's a negativity. Your main job is to create new and beautiful things. Focus on positive things, and usually more often than not, the problems will take care of themselves if you're creating enough positives. It occurred to me, that's a good life lesson. Instead of always confronting problems head on and imagining in your life you gotta solve all your problems, look to create good things in your life, and sometimes that solves the problems. Like in a relationship that is struggling, look to do fun things together or new things together, and problems get solved. He had a very specific theory about worship. Oh, he taught me this a lot. He, he thought that worship in America was too wordy. It was a discursive storm. You'd walk into a worship and ministers would prattle on, kind of like I'm doing now, but also announcements and liturgies that were filled with words upon words. It was a storm of words. And he said, Jim, if you have too many words in a service, People won't know which ones are the important words. So he actually had a word count for worship services. You weren't allowed to exceed it. And he made sure there was a time of silence. He said, not too many words. Allow silence and space for mystery and majesty. It occurs to me that's a life lesson too. We try to fill up our lives not just with a lot of noise, but activity and content. We're always filling it up. You need some space in your life to allow the mystery and the majesty to happen. He also had a theory about churches that they have too many rules. He said, Jim, don't make too many rules. Don't try to or over organize the place. He said, Jim, First Plymouth is not a three ring circus. It's a 25 ring circus but don't try to harmonize everything and create lots of rules and procedures. People need a sense of freedom and to be able to express themselves authentically. Sure, he said, Jim, you need the right amount of rules, but not too many procedures and rules. Watch out for that. Well, in our own lives, we can have a lot of rules we try to follow or procedures for living that we think are the best, but you also have to live spontaneously and authentically. He was a great coach. 
And when Otis preached, it was a similar thing. He would take scripture and such, of course, as a preacher, but it always ended up being a, a practical lesson in living. He had this deeply practical sensibility. I want to offer some of that to you right now from my coach. He preached a sermon here on February 6th, 1972, that we could still learn a lot from. Let me convey this sermon to you. He began with a story about Sidney Harris. Sidney Harris was that longtime columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, kind of legendary. And one time in his column, he described a personal experience. He was walking along the street with a friend who happened to be a Quaker. And they stopped at a newsstand, and his friend bought a newspaper. He thanked the newsman profusely, but the guy selling the paper just kind of didn't even pay him any attention. And as they walked away, Sidney said to his friend, boy, that is a sullen fellow, isn't it? And his friend said, his friend said oh, he's like that every day. And then Sidney said, well then, why are you so polite to him? And his friend said, why not? Why should I let him determine how I'm going to act? That sentence stuck with Harris. And later, as he thought about it, he realized the most important word was act. This friend of his acted out of his own internal sense of values, out of his own sense of purpose and who he was as a person. He acted out of those principles. He didn't just react to others. Oh, so often in life, we just are reacting. And we can lose a sense of what we hold as our values. We just react. At that moment in the sermon, Otis Young went to 1 Peter in our scripture. And he said that it's interesting, one of the things that Peter remembers about Jesus is that he didn't react to others. He acted out of his own principles. It's in 1 Peter that it says, even when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile others. He didn't react. He acted out of his own convictions. Well, it's hard to be like Jesus sometimes. And we get caught caught in constant reactions. Otis said we fall into a seesaw system. Uh, we imagine life is a seesaw, so if we meet someone that is smarter than us, suddenly we react and we feel like we're not smart. It becomes a seesaw. If we meet someone that is beautiful and rich, somehow we feel like we're impoverished. It becomes this seesaw, the way we react to others. Life is not a zero-sum game. It doesn't work that way, but we react all the time to our social climate. We let people around us determine how we will feel and what we will do. And if you fall into constant comparisons with others, it's a form of deep suffering. Life will always be hard and sad if you're reacting instead of acting out of your values, your own sense of purpose. I know what happens to me. When I was a young minister, I used to attend a National Ministers Conference. And I would be amazed at how wonderful these ministers were and their skills and their insight and their wisdom. And every year it made me feel badly about myself. Why is that? Life isn't a seesaw system. I'm my own kind of minister, but I would always feel like I was less of a minister and I, year after year it took me years to finally be able to celebrate that these other ministers are awesome. That's great. That doesn't say anything about me. I was just reacting. It makes life hard. I still kind of react sometimes instead of acting out of my own principles. For example, if I'm in a room of a theological or political discussion and everyone in that room is really liberal, I tend to become the most conservative person in that room because I think I'm always worried about extremes and I think I'm trying to go towards the middle, but really, I'm just reacting. Why can't I just speak about my own beliefs the way I hold them without reacting like that? Or if I'm in a room of the most conservative theological, political viewpoints, 
I become the most liberal. Well, that's just reacting. Speak your own truth. Act. But we can all just fall into reactions. Oh, I heard one this week. It hit home. Uh, a friend of mine was driving south on 27th Street, and the lanes merge around Highway 2, and sometimes the cars are jockeying to get in. And she didn't mean to, but I think she didn't allow a car to get in there. And that person in the other car flipped her off. Just reacted. We've all, probably all of us, have reacted on the road with a horn honk or something. Well, this guy flipped her off. And then as they drove south on 27th, she noticed he seemed to be heading the same way. And then after a couple miles, they pulled into the same building. <laughs> they were going to the same place. They get out of the cars, and they realize they sort of knew each other. Now, he didn't feel good about how he had reacted, right? Now, we need to act out of our principles, not just constantly react. There's a moment in Scripture that could remind us of that. It's in the great Sermon on the Mount. And it shows again that Jesus, he was trying to teach us not to react, but act out of your best self. He said, you've heard it said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist others. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, don't strike back. Offer the other cheek. Don't react. He even goes on to say, you should love your enemies. The people that hate you just don't react to their hate. Live out of the love that you claim. Well, this is hard. It's hard not to constantly react. So this year, we're about to head into a new year. Let me just offer this. If you feel like you're about to react to others around you, Say to yourself, I know who I am. Oh, wait, even say more. If you're about to react to something, say, I know who I am, and I know whose I am. We're God's people. I know who I am. I know whose I am. May this be a wonderful year for you, not of just reaction, but of acting out of who you are as a person. Amen.